the Danes had the so-called uh, mulatto school in the castle. But the castle school done and managed by the Danes uh, was only meant for the mulattoes, not for the uh, ordinary indigenous uh, children. In other words, no uh, true African children or also children were meant to go to school in the castle. But then, when the Basel missionaries arrived, you know, in 1828, one of the first things they wanted to do was to uh, bring the Christian faith to the community through education. Because they think that if they illumine the mind of the people through education, they will be receptive to the gospel message. And it is uh, interesting to know that when the first four Basel missionaries were coming in 1828, there was an Osu citizen who accompanied them. This Osu citizen called Noe Dohona or Frederick Noe Dohona had been sent to Denmark by his father through one of the uh, returning Danish governors, Governor Richelieu, you know, uh, about uh, 1820 thereabout, uh, with the intention that this young Osu citizen will learn, uh, will be trained, and then come back to lead uh, the, the development of the country. So he was the uh, person who was made to accompany the four uh, Basel missionaries. And when they were coming, they were given, or he and the missionaries were given, each of them, three copies of a gun dictionary, which had been uh, uh, produced by a Danish uh, philologist in Denmark. Why? Because the intention was that the missionaries were coming to educate, not only to evangelize, but to educate. In fact, evangelization through education. So the first real school was established at uh, Osu by this uh, missionary. Of course, they died with time, and then eventually uh, the uh, Basin missionaries had to hire or to encourage some uh, Africans from the Caribbean, former slaves, to come and help establish the church. And uh, some of them were teachers. So one uh, started the uh, Basel Mission School at Osu. But then, when in 1854, the Osu community was bombarded by the British, the fiscal space, the building where the school children were coming to be taught was destroyed. So the missionaries had to move from Osu to Abukobi to seek refuge. But after that, they came back and uh, they decided that they would establish a big educational facility, you know, because what they had as a small thing near the castle was bombarded. And it happened that one of the Osu mulattoes who was going to the castle school, the mulatto school, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christian Randolph, he somehow was not very much for the Danish uh, uh, um, education because they were not uh, teaching uh, English. They were teaching Danish. But he wanted to have English. Now, so he was one of the pupils who assisted the Basel missionaries to acquire a property, a piece of land, outside the traditional area on the northeast of Osu. And that's where Osu Salem building was uh, 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 built. And the missionaries decided that they would use that to attract those who have become Christians to move from the traditional quarters, the four quarters I've already made reference to, you know, Osu Alata, Osu Ashinti Bruhum, Osu Anoho, Osu uh, Kinkawe. 
for them to move out of the traditional communities to come and join the school children you know, who have been made to come to the Osu Salem. So because of that, that area also became, if you like it, the fifth traditional area. But of course, it was only meant for the Christians, the Osu uh, native people who have become Christians to live in that area. You know. Now, so uh, the uh, Osu Salem as a building, you know, was be uh, became the nucleus, as it were, of the new uh, Christian traditional quarters. Of course, uh, as a community, they have to have other facilities, including uh, a church building, including market, and all this is began to evolve around the Osu Salem building. But let's concentrate first on the school building itself. It was therefore meant to be like a mini uh, monastery where the school children who had been brought from their homes to have continuous interaction with their teachers. So the Osu Salem had, uh, besides the classrooms, they have dormitories for the school children. And then they also have staff accommodation. So the school children were living every day with their teachers. And they were being taught, they were being trained, they were being given skills, all within the confines of the school. So it became like um, an institution. In fact, uh, as some people have made reference to, it becomes like a military institution where a lot of emphasis is on discipline. So the school children even have uniforms like soldiers. They have a belt you know, to wear you know, on their uh, school jacket. Now, so the Osu Salem building the, is uh, uh, meant to be, uh, if you like it, a mini um, monastery, a body house where you lived to work, to learn, to train, to socialize, to worship, because worship is one of the most important part of the whole mission of the uh, Basel missionaries. The uh, architecture of Osu Salem was meant to manifest the uh, educational philosophy which the missionaries had, that it should be a training of these young Ghanaian or Africans to have their head be formed or informed, to have their hearts you know, be influenced and to have their hands, you know, be provided with the skills. So there was the philosophy of the three A's. Train the head, train the heart, training the hands. And all these were to reflect in the architecture. So the building, as an uh, architectural entity, made provision for facilities, classrooms, to train the head, to learn, to study, to analyze, to think. And then, besides the classrooms, provision was made to have a place of worship, an assembly hall, and a courtyard within which there will be a gathering every day, you know, to uh, interact uh, with the teachers, to interact with one another, and to interact with God, so that your heart will be trained. And then, facilities for being given skills, so that on the uh, northwest of the building, uh, there's a place for industrial, or if you like, semi-industrial activities, like uh, you know, tool shop, a workshop, blacksmithery, uh, provision, uh, kilns, you know, a place for, you know, uh, making uh, tiles, bricks, you know, for burning, you know, for baking, you know, in the kilns, and so and so forth. 
Now, the uh, building was uh, modeled, the school building, the uh, society building was modeled on the uh, Southern German architecture, which had uh, it's a two-story structure. We had a timber-framed building, which made provision for any material to be uh, put in to close the gaps, so that it's similar to what uh, is referred to as the fat deck house, the uh, Tudor uh, you know, structure building. And the structure uh, which consisted of timber, came from all the way from uh, northern Germany and southern uh, um, uh, Denmark, where you have the type of pine which was well treated and were carved and already shaped and brought down as prefabricated materials. If you go, you can see some of the indications of how the materials were uh, um, described so they could be put together. Now, this structure then became the uh, model, which was uh, repeated in other uh, Basel missionary uh, uh, schools. Now, the, uh, build, the uh, master builders who led in the construction were the missionaries, the Basel missionaries. Some were Southern Germans, some were Swiss. But then the actual construction, the labor which was provided came from the local community. Bear in mind that some of these uh, local people had worked for the days in the castle. So they have acquired building skills to enable them to be able to work together with this uh, uh, Basin missionary craftsmen or uh, uh, master builders to erect the building. And then they used, apart from the timber frames which were brought from northern Germany or southern Denmark, they also used local materials. And then they used local timber to create uh, new pieces which were used as roofing, the so-called, uh, um, the, the, the materials they used, uh, shingles, they call it wood shingles, you know and then they have wooden pegs to hold them in position. Now, so this uh, building uh, became the model, you know, for uh, educational building. In fact, it was the first, according to the records we have, the first custom-made uh, school building in this country, you know. And that was run about, it was uh, about 1860, uh, thereabout. So this, uh, building has stood for over 150 years. And according to <clears throat> information we had from some of the uh, you know, people who trained there, in 1939, when the uh, earthquake took place in Osu and other parts of Accra, the building did not show any sign of uh, destruction. It was shaken, but nothing came down as compared to what we have referred to already in the Richter Fort, where the Barbary House, you know, the first floor completely uh, was uh, demolished. So the building, uh, which was modeled, you know, on the uh, German, Southern German architecture, proved to be very, very uh, versatile. And of course, it had the foundation, which was very similar to what the Danes did in the Christenburg, the stone masonry, you know, basin. And today, if you go to the building, you see still some of the uh, original stone materials which are used to be the foundation. Some of the timber which uh, were used you know, for the structure as well as the uh, floor uh, uh, you know, slabs are still intact, it's still there. Some, of course, have been uh, affected by the weather and by some insects. But uh, from the uh, research we did some few years ago, uh, most over ninety percent of the building, you know, in terms of its material, uh, is still intact. At the initial stages, the majority of the children who came were from the uh, mulatto 
uh, families because they were those who were already in school or were in the church. You know, remember they were they were going to the uh, castle school, but then a number of the indigenous families were also showing interest in the uh, mission work. So they also sent their children, you know, to the school. So they were. Uh, though at the initial stages, the majority will be the mulatto children, like those uh, like uh, uh, Randolph or uh, Randolph or uh, Eggman or locals. But then there were also those who were coming, especially from the uh, traditional authority homes, or chiefs' houses, like the Dawona, you know, like the uh, Mensans. They were coming. Now, the traditional society uh, has a system of education, no schools. Now, the word school, I think, surely is uh, an European concept. I think we start from uh, Latin, you know, scola. Now, so uh, we can't talk about schools as such in the traditional system, but we talk about a system of education. And the system of education was based on the uh, philosophy that every individual who is part of a community must make a contribution to the survival and the enhancement of that community. So there's a way of letting the individual child, when brought up, uh, I mean when uh, giving birth to, to be exposed to the system of education. It starts from the home. Uh, as is always said, for the African, uh, you are because we are. Your individuality is based on the communality. So in the family, which is not, uh, if you like, the micro family, but is the extended, there are the uh, uncles, there are the aunties, then they are the grandparents. And these are the people who are the agents who pass on the values. So the training or the education starts from the confines of the family. And then there's an age of puberty. You know, we have the, uh, uh, the puberty rights, the time of maturity for the individual child. Now, the system of the puberty rights is another level of education because the boy or the girl who goes through the puberty rights are exposed to some values, to some, some skills, some knowledge which he has to acquire to be able to play his or her role in the society in which he's growing into. Then beyond the puberty rights, then there will be the uh, if you like it, the uh, specific social groups, the group of hunters, the group of seamen or sea, sea, uh, 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 the fishermen, within that kind of, um, if you like, a vocational group, education goes on. The young person is known to go to sea, but learning, whilst he's taking on to go to sea, he knows about the weather, he knows about the position of the stars. And the relationship to the sea, uh, fish, and so on and so forth. He knows uh, is uh, made to know when to row and when to keep still. He knows when uh, you can set a sail. Now, all these are educational uh, uh, systems which are given to the child, so that uh, by the time a child becomes an adult, he is fully prepared to make his contribution to the advancement of the uh, uh, society. Of course. There's no uh, literary uh, educational system. It was not literary. They were not right. They were not being taught to write or to, um, you know, uh, yes. Uh, there was sign language. They were made to understand from sign languages, but not to write. So uh, coming back to uh, the schools, we cannot compare the school with the traditional system of education. Now, the advantage those 
first group of children had when they went to the school was that when we went to the boarding school was that they were coming from their various communities as i said they were brought from the four different uh, um, traditional communities where they have already been told what they were supposed to know before uh, uh, they came to the school because they had gone through the puberty rights so they were coming as it were not as empty uh, uh, clean slates to be uh, introduced to European education. No, they had the African, uh, uh, if you like it, the, the values in their heads before they were exposed to, uh, you know, what the Basel missionaries gave them. The children were prepared to be able to take it in because, you know, the transitions they go through. You know, from childhood until the time, you know, six plus for them to leave home, they are exposed because of the um, uh, communal way of living. They are already exposed to so many things from different uncles, from different aunties, from different grandmothers, from different others. So by the time they get, they got exposed to this European-centered education. I think they were very versatile to be able to take on something which was completely different though, but because as it were, they've been prepared to be able to take on things from different people, they were able to also to take on from the missionaries uh, what they brought, you know, and the dress style, because for example, uh, uh, school uh, uniform, right? Uh, you have to uh, dress well to conform. There was need for wearing shoes. Some of the children uh, didn't know how to wear shoes because they were used to, you know, uh, going around barefooted. You know, but they had to learn. And one of the, uh, I, I believe, one of the positive things about the school is that it made the children to build their capacity to learn. They were able to be confront. I mean, they were able to confront new things, which they got well adapted to. You know, uh, uh, I know uh, if I want to digress a little bit, uh, when you take the, uh, the uh, average American student or uh, 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 the average American child into a new situation, you'll be completely lost. But the average African child will not. Why? Because already in the home situation. In the family situation, he was exposed to so many things which he had to adapt quickly to survive. So his uh, ability to su survive is stronger than the ordinary American child, for example. Right? Uh, when I go back into uh, my personal observation of uh, you know school, I mean university students uh, in Ghana and the experience I had in Germany, I realized that. The Ghanaian, or for that matter, the African child, is equipped to be very versatile and therefore can easily adapt. Look at how they adapted to um, the weather. You know, uh, back in the 17th century, a person like uh, Protin, you know, uh, who saw snow for the first time at the age of 12, or two, I mean, he was able to adapt very quickly. Or the Ghanaian. Uh, uh, man, the uh, Antonio Guillotin Amu, you know, who was taken at the age of three to Europe. I mean, he survived because of the, you know, as I said, the versatile nature of the uh, child, because of the, uh, uh, you know, the home training or the family training or the communal training. You know. So, uh, yes, the uh, first initial exposure would have been quite a challenge. But I think they were able to adapt very quickly. Somebody has said it made them also to become schizophrenic, to live in two worlds. <laughs> they were living in the world of the mission uh, two, three months at the boarding school, and then they went back uh, into their family's uh, uh, situation, which is completely different. So they were living in two worlds. But once again, they were able to adapt very quickly. And they were able to take advantage. That's why. Uh, Osu Salem School, I mean, the history of the products is always uh, uh, something to, uh, 
you know, sort of to talk about, where they produce some of the first early, uh, you know, intellectuals in the country because of the basis they had at the society, uh, which had been influenced by what they had brought from their homes. Uh, 